Around 1999, uh, Mike McRae and I uh, secured a grant from the NCAA, uh, which we called the NCAA Concussion Study, and uh, we uh, studied uh, football players from uh, 29 uh, NCAA Division uh, 1, 2, and 3 institutions, and it really set the stage and was really a catalyst for a lot of the work that we've been doing here for the past several years. It uh, resulted in a number of publications uh, that allowed us to uh, validate uh, concussion uh, assessment tools such as uh, the balance error scoring system, the standardized assessment of concussion, and a number of other uh, neurocognitive uh, assessment tools. At that time in 2003 when we published those initial studies that were again called the NCAA concussion study, uh, it was the largest sample of concussed athletes uh, in the literature. Uh, we were able to identify predispositions to future injuries uh, such as a, a three to four fold risk of uh, future injuries once you've had three or more concussions in a five year window, uh, as well as uh, being able to uh, predict those who were more at risk for uh, subsequent concussions. Since that time, uh, here at the University of North Carolina, uh, we've been studying uh, athletes on uh, most of our 28 varsity sports. We baseline screen them uh, using uh, balance testing, neurocognitive tests, and, and symptom checklists. In the event that they sustain a concussion, we're able to then track them serially over several uh, days following that injury to make a more informed return to play decision. In 2004, we secured a grant from the CDC which allowed us to, to place accelerometers in the helmets of our football players. Uh, uh, every year since that time, we've had approximately 60 players uh, that have been geared up with this uh, system called the HIT system, which stands for the Head Impact Telemetry System. Uh, this system allows us to record in real time uh, the number of impacts and the magnitude and location of those impacts uh, in our uh, college football players here at UNC. And uh, that NCAA study from um, just four or five years earlier uh, really sort of set the stage for this uh, groundbreaking work uh, that has really allowed us to better understand the biomechanics of, of concussion. I think the HIT system, first off, tells us how big a HIT is. So essentially it measures the impact magnitude. It gives us measures of linear acceleration, rotational acceleration. It pr builds some head impact uh, se severity profiles as far as each impact that we're seeing. It gives us an idea of the location of those impacts. So it certainly allows us to measure the severity of the impact. It also allows us to measure where on the head that, Im that impact is occurring. The HIT system doesn't modify the helmet itself. It just uses a gap that's currently available in the padding of a Riddell helmet, specifically the Revolution, the Speed, and in older versions, the VSR4. And there's six single axis accelerometers, um, which, which are embedded inside the helmet, that allow us to measure linear acceleration and, and, and estimate to a certain extent rotational acceleration following e each impact. The location of the accelerometers also allows the data to be translated through an algorithm and identify the location of where that impact occurred with the athlete. At the start of the season, we'll make sure our equipment staff properly fits our athletes uh, w w with the proper helmet. If it's a helmet that would then be eligible to be fitted with the HIT system accelerometers, we'll then sit down with the athlete, describe the study, um, obviously uh, you know, obtain our informed consent with them, and then if they approve and they want to be in the study, then we'll fit them with accelerometers. We've collected over 350,000 head impacts over the course of the last seven football seasons. Uh, you know, we've learned that there are no light days necessarily in football. Uh, our earlier work has suggested that helmets only practices were on average as severe as the impacts we were seeing in games. Um, and you know, more recently we're looking at the relationship between the impact magnitude and the severity of the injury outcome that we're observing and also looking at different play types to see if there are, you know, it, whether or not it's a special team player, an offensive or defensive play that might be driving some of the, the, the bigger hits during the game that we're concerned with. The question that's often asked is what is linear acceleration? What is rotational acceleration? Essentially, an impact can begin in one of two ways. One is a direct impact to the helmet. Another is an indirect impact to the head, which would be an example of body blowing an athlete so that they have this, this whiplash mechanism. In the first instance, with a direct impact to the head, if it strikes the front of the helmet, as here, the head may travel in a strictly linear fashion. And that would be an example of linear acceleration. The reality is in most impacts that occur in football, there's a combination of both linear and rotational accelerations that are occurring. So when that strike comes through, not only is there a linear component, but there's also a rotational component of the head because the head is anchored by the neck to the body. And so there's some rotation that's occurring there. 
in an indirect impact that would strike the athlete to the uh, body, there's also a component of that whiplash mechanism where we would see a rotational component as well as a forward translation of the head center gravity at the same time. Some additional information that we can capture with the HIT system is azimuth and elevation. And azimuth essentially identifies where along this x-axis that impact is occurring and elevation explains where along the up-down path that impact is occurring. And so by using those two bits of information, we could start to isolate where impacts are occurring on the head, whether that be on the side, right or left, whether it be to the top of the head, the back, or even the front of the helmet. At this time, the HIT system is not to be used as a diagnostic tool. Uh, there's not enough information available for us to identify an injured player in the absence of that player uh, coming off with uh, symptoms that they're reporting to the sideline medical staff or the sideline medical staff observing signs of an injury at the time of, time of impact. In our data, less than one quarter of one percent of impacts exceeding theoretical thresholds that exist in the literature are actually resulting in a diagnosed concussion. So it's a very, very small number at this time. The system just isn't quite geared up to identify injury. In our earlier work, we were identifying as many as 20% of impacts were occurring to the top of the head, or anyway, what we were defining as the top of the head. Uh, in more recent work, we've identified that number to be dropping down to about 13-14%. Um, specifically over the last five years, it was lower than the first three, and so a lot of things can factor into that. It could be a different coaching technique, it could be a different style of player. We like to think that the grassroots are, are addressing the problem of hitting with the top of the head and they're coaching that out of young athletes. So by the time we've been studying them for the latter half of our work, we've been noticing a downward trend in some of the top of head impacts that we're observing. So this is a really special time for uh, concussion researchers. Uh, the NCAA, as well as several other organizations, are really uh, stepping up and putting funds forward uh, to, to help us better understand this and to, uh, to utilize uh, student athletes, uh, professional athletes, uh, as uh, study participants to understand concussion. Uh, we've now embarked on a project uh, which is called the National Concussion Outcome Study. Uh, it's a group of, of researchers from uh, UCLA, Michigan, University of North Carolina, and the Medical College of Wisconsin. And uh, the funds that have uh, recently uh, come from the NCAA are going to allow us to, to study a variety of athletes, to study not only the biomechanics of, of this injury, but also uh, to be able to track recovery and uh, look at a number of factors such as uh, better understanding whether or not there truly is an increased incidence of a concussion in female athletes. So we'll be able to study uh, men's and women's soccer players to, to again, uh, take a look at the uh, incidence rates uh, and, and what may explain any differences uh, in concussion incidents uh, if it does exist. 